My name is Renee Duprell, and I'm the Director of Development here at the Institute for Systems Biology. Thank you all for joining us for our April Research Roundtable. This is our virtual series that we host to keep you up to date on research at ISB. This series is geared towards non-scientists, and our goal is to make our work more approachable as well to all. Uh, our intention is to have one of these just about every month, so keep an eye out for our emails. Today we'll be hearing from our featured scientist, and then there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after that. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to submit questions at any time. I'll be monitoring those, and when Sui is done with his presentation, we'll move to the question and answer session, and we'll work through those questions. On March 12th, Washington State transitioned from statewide mask requirements to mask recommendations for many, but not all, indoor settings. And that's created some questions for those of us who are wondering if we should still wear a mask into the supermarket or to the gym. Our speaker today is going to help us with this conundrum. Sui Huang is an MD, a PhD, and a professor here at ISB. He is a molecular and cell biologist, and he's devoted his research to understanding cancer from a complex systems perspective. Before Sui joined ISB, he held faculty positions at the University of Calgary and Harvard Medical School Children's Hospital. We're talking to Sui today about masks because he wrote an article two weeks after the world shut down due to COVID in March of 2020, arguing that we should all be wearing masks and discussing the scientific evidence behind that. The article was read tens of thousands of times. It, it really was quite popular. So here to explain all of that to us and answer our questions is Sui. Welcome, Sui. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Renee. So uh, do you hear me? And let me share this. Yes, I, I can hear you. Um, okay, good. Uh, as you've heard from Renee, we are entering a phase where nothing is uh, set in stone and there's so many guidelines and probably you've heard a lot now about the uh, mask. So I don't want to repeat all the guidelines and all the uh, things that you hear, but instead, since we're a science research institute, tell you the scientific basis behind so that you can make your own decisions. And my goal is to make it to give you some perspective that you haven't heard, really a more unique perspective so that you have a tool for thought and can make your decisions, your own decisions. Um, is am I slightly advancing now? Uh, we can see your, yeah. Okay, good. So let me start with an example from science. And the question is where do scientific statements come from on which uh, actionable, information is based. For example, uh, somebody might claim vitamin C may help shorten the duration of common cold. As you know, you've probably heard that. And is that true or not? So where does biomedical factual knowledge come from? And I will give you a framework and then apply that to a uh, mask and COVID uh, prevention. So in science, uh, we need to first deal with epistemology. And that's a science about why we know something and how we know it. And here we have to distinguish between uh, two things, uh, the data driven approach that you see on the left and then uh, a mechanistic approach. So everything data driven is green from now on and the mechanistic reasoning thinking on the right, uh, that will be blue. And in the case of vitamin C, you can see that uh, the mechanism is that vitamin C will activate these white blood cells as one of the mechanisms which can make them become aggressive and they could eat up the bacteria, digest them, secrete biochemicals that they kill the bacteria. So that's a function of vitamin C that people have been known for a long time. And based on that, Linus Pauling, as you know, famously suggested that uh, vitamin C could cut the days short or even stop a, a, a common cold or in general, increase your immune system. Uh, that's a mechanistic approach. Absolutely no reason that it could be true. Therefore, in medicine, we need the left-hand side, what is called the empirical real-world evidence, data-driven approach. And if you look at this data now, this is so-called a, a meta-analysis, where every row here is one paper, one huge study. And then people have uh, put in uh, the results these dots here. The blue line here is if vitamin C has no effect. And then if it goes to the left, 
it means I just shorten the duration of the cold and the position of the dot is the summary of the paper. You can see here, uh, some paper show that it uh, has an effect. And so we are, this is now covered, but then many, many papers show that you might have no effect. And so the real world evidence is that things are really uh, messy and uh, it's hard to get to a conclusion. So for good science, we always need both sides. Uh, if you rely only on data-driven side, then these studies might be not well designed, you have confounders and so on. We all know these problems. On the other hand, you can also not just rely on mechanistic reasoning because uh, or lab results because they might not translate into the real world and uh, reality is just much more complex than theory. So that's the, uh, the difficulty of uh, science, medical science. And at ISB, I think if we do both. It's a multi prong approach where we try to integrate real world data with a molecular biology mechanism. Now uh, you can apply that to uh, COVID. Uh, the uh, mechanistic approach would be trying to understand how transmission works, how the, the droplets go into the lung and how masks can protect you. And you can do experiments and do a lot of measurements. On the other hand, in the data driven approach, you have uh, for example, you can make studies uh, like here, you look at people without masks and people uh, who uh, wear a mask and then you compare the percentage of uh, the people that get infected. And so that we just one study in those meta-analyses that I've done shown, you could look at the, you know, whether case numbers decreased after mask mandate were introduced and so on. Here is another data from the US where the brown bars are states without the mask mandate and the y-axis is the, uh, the case rate in a particular time point. So you can see there is some trend, but it's hard to make a conclusion. And of course, those things are very uh, subject to bias and political interpretation and so on. We're not going to that, but we like to focus on the science. So the science is uh, shown here, sorry. I, uh, you see the, uh, we have to distinguish between uh, two things, one second, let's move that away. So let's focus on the mechanistic aspect. And here you can distinguish between two modes by which air droplets and particles are transported. One is called diffusive, like in the smoke here, where there's no net flow from outside. And then you have this bulk transport when you, there's a, uh, a force from outside that introduces a net flow. And that's true for smoking, uh, when the smoke comes out of a pipe or if you exhale. And that's also true for human, uh, the tiny droplets that we exhale, you can cough it out or can just uh, exhale. And so that's a major difference that uh, will give us some insight on the mechanism. Uh, in fact, that's shown here, if you exhale, you have this diffusion where these tiny droplets makes this roll like movement and it starts to fill the room slowly. Uh, if you vocalize, it gets stronger. And on the other extreme, you have shouting, coughing and sneezing, where you have uh, this uh, convective transport in one direction. So it's a net, net bulk transport in one direction. And that uh, is uh, affect the size of the uh, droplets. So on the left-hand side, we call this aerosols. And on the right hand side, uh, we have uh, droplets. Uh, okay, so um, aerosol are the vehicle that carry the virus. So it's not a virus that flows through the air, but they're always in, in these little, tiny little droplets. Aerosols are smaller than 10 micron, and that would be very important, or some people define it as smaller than 5 micron. And droplets are much bigger. You can see that there's almost 1 million more space you need to, to carry things. Uh, what is important to know is that uh, they get shot out of the mouth at very high muscle velocity and reach several feet away, whereas aerosol will float in the room. And if you're in a closed room, you will eventually fill the room. Whereas droplets here, they reach typically uh, two, sorry, six, two meters or six feet and they drop to the floor. 
And that's important to know because you all know about social distancing. So how does that affect social distancing? And what people have measured recently is that the drift in the air can carry COVID virus for an hour or more in a non-ventilated room. And that's why uh, you can already appreciate from this picture here, indoor uh, social distancing is not very meaningful because the room will be filled if there's no ventilation. So what's the biophysics behind? Um, and that's now key because now we are entering the interface between the physics and the anatomy. It turns out that uh, in order to go deep in the lung, you have to be very small because these bronchi have laminar flow here and to be carried down, droplets have to be in the form of aerosol, whereas the large droplets that get sneezed out, they, uh, they don't reach far down. So typically in the upper trachea. And that's an important difference because we have now the biology of the virus, uh, which is shown here. As you know, we move from Delta to Omicron and they changed. They changed the molecular properties such that uh, Delta was specialized in colonizing cells in deep in the lung, whereas the Omicron kind of due to the mutations, it require less of these uh, docking molecules on the surface of the epithelium. And it also deals, it's, it's weaker in dealing with the intracellular immune system, which is uh, strong deep in the lung. And so that we have here, if we have the nasal epithelium here, it turns out that uh, Delta would be preferentially entering the human body deeper in the lung, whereas Omicron would preferentially infect the cells that line the nasal epithelium. So that's a qualitative change, uh, but we know Omicron is much, much more transmissive, but it also looks like it's less um, virulent, probably because it doesn't handle uh, this intracellular interferon well, which uh, prevents viral replication. Uh, and it gets, uh, it enters more of these nasal epithelium cells. So now coming back to the physics, it means that, that uh, Omicron probably is more likely to be transmitted through these big droplets that are coughed out as opposed to these uh, tiny aerosols that float in the entire room. So we have really concrete consequences of this distinction. Um, all right, so that's why that's all new. All this finding came up in the last few months, but this is space to watch. And that is, could it be that transmission by a large droplets would be more relevant again, like uh, you know, in a common cold and other diseases? Okay, now this distinction between aerosols and droplets has consequences for protection. Uh, and let's go quickly through all these things. I think that many of you have heard hundreds of times, but now with this scientific perspective. Social distancing, you know, uh, it works well for these droplets because they drop, as I mentioned earlier, uh, within six feet to the floor. But if you're in a room, non-ventilated, then it probably doesn't have much meaning. Staying outdoors is very important for aerosols. They get carried away and dispersed by, by wind and by the air, the open space. However, in terms of droplets, uh, outdoors doesn't help much because you're near somebody who sneezes and you're still near and the droplets can uh, reach your, your nose and your mouth. So we have a, 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 a matrix here of, of a, this checkerboard pattern that I think is worth being aware of. It means that indoor social distancing has little meaning and we, we don't hear that much. And outdoors, uh, you know, this six feet distancing uh, is fine in general, but coughing and sneezing and even reach beyond that. And now that Omicron probably is uh, transmitted by this mode, uh, we might want to pay attention to that. Masks, uh, I think I'm not going to the details. Everyone knows about these different types of masks. Uh, if you want to protect against aerosol, the base is of course the N95 respirator, and then you have those uh, clothes masks that do very poorly and in the intermediate who have these surgical masks. For the large droplets, it, it's more important to have kind of a physical barrier and therefore close masks might help. 
to some extent. Some people still wear face shields. I think it's clear if you look at this uh, diffusion-like transport that face shields have probably no effect because air can go underneath. The plexiglass might have some effect in protection against these big droplets. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure whether you, you want to interrupt or so, Renee, but if somebody has questions, please interrupt. Uh, otherwise, let's move forward uh, another 15 minutes or so. Uh, now, what's the physics behind the face masks? And just to give you an impression, because on the right hand side, the blue side of the mechanism, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a mental or a visual notion of what actually is in that material. And we have dense meshwork of fibers. And what is important to know is that the mask don't ask, don't work like a sieve that just filter out by size. It does so to some extent, a big one that's called the uh, blocking by impact, but also block by, uh, by having the particle stick to the surface of these fibers. It's called interception. And it's mostly against diffusion, against this type of uh, movement. And the, uh, the good face mask also have an electrostatic charge that uh, allows the, attract the particles. If the watery particles get polarized and they stick here. If you look at the mask, oh, what do they protect against? I think it's obvious that this mechanism here protects against big droplets, but for the smallest one, you need electrostatic charge. And uh, what do the masks offer? So a particular property of the respirator mask is that they're typically electro electrostatically charged through an electric effect where in the manufacturing process, charge is included and it stays there. It has a denser fiber meshwork and surgical masks typically don't have. They rely on a hydrophilic surface that attracts the water droplet. So that's the main difference. And it also gives you the appreciation that uh, you cannot just wash them and, and, and dry them and so on because you might lose electrostatic charge. And you might lose the hydrophilic surface. Hey, Sui, we do have one question. Yeah. Uh, and the question, the question is, to what extent does a beard impact the benefit of wearing a mask? A beard? Sorry. A beard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's important. Mm -hmm. for, those, for those that have the, the joy of being, you know, in, in, in the military and, and learned about uh, anti-chemical warfare uh, masks, you will know that beard is very really bad because... Uh, I forgot to mention, it's a good question, because the face mask also sealed, so you have to be totally sealed around it. So I was talking here only about passage through the mask and uh, the sealing that the, the, uh, the respirators afford is uh, very important. And so if a fear that can interfere with that, with a surgical mask, it's not so relevant because you don't try to seal your mask. Uh, that's important. It's a good question. It is good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, what I want to say is that uh, the clever thing about electrostatic charge is increases uh, the filtering effect without making a, having to have a denser mesh. So you can increase filtering effect without uh, affecting increasing resistance. Always trade off, right? If you make it too dense and you cannot breathe but electrostatic force tries to alleviate that uh, need for compromise. Okay, so since we talk about science, let's talk about numbers, because I think most people have a little bit of trouble interpreting all the numbers that we hear. And the take home message will be that numbers matter and nothing is black and white. For example, if you talk about uh, six feet distance, why do we have six feet? What does it mean? Tip Typical interpretation is, okay, I'm within six feet, that's not good, and I'm beyond six feet, I'm safe. People have this picture in mind, right? So this is a distance from the source of the infection. And if you are beyond six feet, then there's nothing to fear. If you are within, it's bad. That's not how nature works. Uh, everything is a, as a gray zone. Uh, there's a function for the decreasing risk with distance, which typically looks not like that, but like that. So it slowly flattens, which means uh, this intermediate zone, 
and if you are less than six feet, you're still okay, much worse than further than six feet, but it's not all or nothing, right? You're not doomed if you are come too close and what matters is also the timing and mask and so on. If you're further apart, uh, by contrast, you are also not 100% safe, but uh, it's just your risk dr dramatically diminishes and very really hard to predict those things based on uh, mathematical modeling. People have actually tried to do that. The famous study in Lancet last year, they calculated that in a given situation, it's mostly actually SARS-1, not SARS-2, uh, at one meter, so three feet, you, let's say, uh, and the source is infected, you have a 12% chance of being uh, infected and two meter away, you are have two to 3% chance. So things smooth out and uh, one has to be aware of that. That's why uh, it's important and what we do at Systems Priority to be quantitative with everything as opposed to these qualitative statements. Same thing for indoor-outdoor. So outdoor is much better. All the data we have suggest uh, almost 20 to 1,000 times lower risk of being infected outdoor. So it's a dramatic effect. I think the strongest thing we can do uh, is correspond to a reduction of relative risk by 95 to 99%. Point nine percent. You can see here if you're trapped in no aeration ventilation, and and you stay long, then you increase the chance of being infected outdoors. The uh, the aerosols disperse immediately. What is still dangerous are the, the direct shooting out of these large droplets. Uh, so outdoors, no mask needed in general. But you still have the situation here. If you come too close to people, so masks are good. And in this case. A simple mask might help uh, prevent these uh, droplets from reaching your, your, your nose and your mouth. Wind also matters. Uh, it's important because uh, you will see in the next slide, but uh, what as far as many people and just came out yesterday in nature, the WHO actually for almost two years didn't admit this mode of uh, transmission, but emphasizes big droplet transmission. And if you want to read just yesterday in nature, there's a report on that and how people complain why WHO didn't admit this from the, uh, from the early days. So it's really hard to understand it's sort of some type of uh, mental rigidity, I think. Anyway, so to be practical, if you're outdoor, of course, outdoor can mean many things. This is outdoor patio, as you can see here. And this is outdoor, obviously, this situation here is better. So again, think when you're outdoor, you should worry about the large droplets that uh, come from coughing and sneezing and talking. And a group actually measured the influence of wind. And what they found is that they look at many, many days and measure wind speed and they, may, they figure out that if wind speed is less than five miles per hour, I really don't know what it means. I'm not a meteorologist, but probably five hour miles per hour is probably uh, a noticeable wind. If it's less than that, they found the increase of uh, COVID incidence by 45%. Not sure what it means and whether that's reproducible or not. As I mentioned earlier, you need many, many studies to confirm that, but the interesting trend. And so pay attention to wind. Now, what about face masks? Again, you see these simplified posters. It says you should wear masks. And most people are again saying, okay, if I wear, I'm safe. If I don't wear, I'm at very high risk. And again, reality is more complicated because of this gray zone and, and quantitative continuous decrease of risk. So an example would be that you noticeably re reduce risk if a mask, but not to zero, that's the main point. And uh, what does it mean? What do these numbers mean? If for example, a study shows you have a 40% 40 40 of people who don't wear masks were infected. And if you look at those that wear masks, 20% or 10% were infected. Does it mean that we have a four fold decrease of risk? So those numbers are difficult to uh, interpret and I try to explain that. So for that, let's go back to this dichotomy of data-driven approach and uh, a mechanistic approach. In the mechanistic view, you will 
C, you hear that the load, the N95 blocks 95% of particles. That's why it's called N95. So and you can actually measure that in the test that beyond the mask, there should be 95% less particles. But does that mean that your risk of being infected is reduced by 95%? That's what some people might think, but it's not the case because uh, it's just more complicated. So it's not uh, as dramatic, right? Even if you measure a 95% decrease of particles. So a typical study that I picked out, which was quite much cited from last year, they found, and that's in the hospital setting, we have much more exposure. Uh, those without mask had a 30, 63% chance of being infected, and those wearing a mask, in this case, the N95 type of mask, it was reduced to 39%. And uh, is that a lot, or is that, should one be disappointed by that? Again, very hard to tell. Uh, we call this a relative risk, right? So from 33 to 39 of those exposed. And that corresponds to 38 or roughly a 40% risk reduction. So from 100 to 60%, right? That's 40%. Uh, what does it mean? Um, for that, we go back to the data-driven approaches and look at studies. And you are familiar by now uh, with this type of meta-analysis. So you do look at many studies similar to the vitamin C, and you can see here the way it's displayed, again, a line for no effect, and dot every row here is a study. If this blue average of every study move towards the right, it means that you have an increased risk. If it moves to the left, you have a decreased risk, right? And you can see most studies show a decreased risk, except this one here, it had very few patients that were of cases, and that's why it's you have this big error bar. So the study here that I mentioned is this here. You can show a significant a statistical significant decrease of the risk of being infected if you wear a mask. Uh, and you can see the variations between studies. So it's very problematic. It depends on how you conduct the study, how many people are there, uh, do you specify which mask and are the only health care worker, in this case it is, or community, which is totally different. Just relatively recently, CDC put out another study where they compare that in California, they just look at people that get positively tested and they ask, did you wear a mask or not? And they get these numbers pretty optimistic. So if you have a N95, you reduce your risk by uh, almost 80%, so much more better than this 40%. Uh, we don't know what it means, but what we can say is that it really depends on the study, but I would put the range between 20 and 80% reduction of risk. I mean, look at many studies. Some studies show barely an effect. And as you know, interpretation depends on political leaning and so on. So that's a, a problem. But I would like to uh, point to another way of looking at these numbers. And that's shown here. Uh, let's say this CDC with, uh, study shows 50%, kind of average. So if somebody tells you uh, wearing a mask reduces your risk by 50%, so one to two, so you have your risk. That's it. What does it mean? Is that a lot or it does very little? You cannot tell because those risks are relative risk. It assumes that you are exposed, right? And what your absolute risk is uh, must take into consideration uh, how much infections there are. So we have to calculate the absolute risk. And for that, you need to know the incidence. And so we make two assumptions. I made this assumption, the seven day new case rate as incidence, the way it's measured is 50 in 100,000. That's exactly the way it was in um, Washington state, King countries even more. And so this is a typical number you should pay attention to because CDC uh, defines below 200 cases in seven days in 100,000 persons uh, to be uh, necessary to define a community as being in a low risk category, and then you can move forward for removing mask mandate. And also you need to have less than 10 hospitalization. So you need to take these numbers and you assume in this case, 20% are asymptomatic. These are the ones you will not catch and the one that uh, transmit. If you do that and you, 
can now convert this 50% into another number. And that's very interesting. That's a number sometimes called uh, NNT in, uh, in clinical trials, the number that you need to treat to have one person having an effect. So here is 50%, given this incidence number means that 16,000 16, people would have to wear a mask for seven days to prevent one new case. So that's reality, right? It sounds like very little and it gives you a different perspective, but still in the aggregate, it means that if a million people would do that, so Seattle and, and King County, it would, it would prevent 63 cases of which maybe 10% go to the hospital. And so you, you do decrease uh, the, the burden for healthcare, but as an individual, this number sounds like very little. And, and that's a dilemma we face, right? It's hard to interpret numbers so that you can deal with it. So to wrap up, uh, with these two levels of uh, views in science, this empirical real world evidence, now more and more called data driven, and the mechanistic view where you have a plausible mechanism that you can figure out in theory, in the computer, in the lab. I mentioned those examples here and uh, ISB, we do both. Uh, now, what are, are the consequences? So this is my takeaway. So first, a plausible mechanism, although they don't translate it into the real world in many cases, is still useful because it, it, based on solid science, gives you a rationale to wear a mask in this case. And you can, since you know the details, you can figure out for situations for which there is, are no guidelines how you would do in a given situation. Right now, you know about droplets versus aerosol, about wind, about uh, electrostatic force or uh, charge. And so that gives you something that you can do even if you don't have data to back up. And on the other side, the data-driven approach uh, in conjunction with mass show there is an efficacy, very clear, but uh, data is highly variable in the real world. It's hard to get and probably the effect is more moderate than we wish it to be. And the consequence for me is that um, the significance of wearing a mask is in the aggregate, in these big numbers that are important for policymakers and not so much for the individuals because it contributes to pandemic control if you can lower the burden uh, of the hospitals. And it's also something that we uh, don't hear a lot. That's the cost benefit considerations. How much of a burden is it to wear a mask? Right? If you don't care, it's a tiny burden and then you're more willing to wear it uh, in situations that you're not sure whether it's useful or not. And then another thing to consider is the common good. So my rule is if my uh, you know, visitors and people I, I encounter have wear a mask and you should wear one just out of courtesy because they probably have a uh, immune uh, deficiency or something uh, out of solidarity and then also to reduce the burden for healthcare. So that's motivation that doesn't affect you personally. And we have to consider that given the moderate number at the individual level, right? the moderate efficacy number at the individual level. Okay, so then I finish that with this uh, widely used metaphor of the Emmental cheese model. So it's a Emmental cheese has holes, and so things go through. But if a multiple layer, you can get protection. You have to apply them at the same time. So the way it works is that the holes are not on the same position, and so they complement each other. And of course, we have social distancing, uh, being outdoor, and fashion masks. And uh, here are some numbers that I summarized, very crude, very conservative, social distancing. At least you cut your risk by half, outdoor significantly more, probably 100 times or so, and facial mask also substantial, but not as high as some people portray. So, and if you multiply that, you can see that you can actually get away with quite a low risk. So I stop here and thank everybody for your attention. I hope there was something new Thank you, Sui. That was great. And I have to say, I love your cheese model. I'm a big fan of cheese, but I really understand that that's a good graphic and a good way to put it. So we do have some questions. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to pose a question to Sui, um, please use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll start working our way through those. In the meantime, 
Um, question number one, Sui, if people reuse N95 or KN95 masks, do they become less effective? Yeah, the, I have to look into data. And I'm not a mask expert, right? So uh, they do. Uh, the electrical charge has so many ways to, uh, to clean them and preserve them, right? Heat is one possibility, but uh, alcohol is not good, for example, things like that. But I, I just stay away from recycling, even that the price are dropping, and that uh, I would limit the use of mask to situation where you need it. And typically, you can use the mask for 20 to 40 hours in the literature, right? So if you okay. use it for one hour a day, last for two, three weeks. And so I take a mask out, I date them, and then after three weeks or a month, I just throw them away. And I think okay. that's the simplest thing to do. Surgical mask is, is tricky, but they're much cheaper. So I, I wouldn't try to recycle for your okay. reasons. Yeah, that, that was the follow-up question for, that this person asked was how many times a mask can be, to, can be reused? And you, you said 40 hours. That's the number you hear. Or N95. So you have to distinguish between total duration and how many times. Right. And for the pro, in the professional setting, you know, they use it for two, three days, all day, right? So. Um, what should a person do to a mask between periods of reuse? And I think we're still talking about an N95 here. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, I hang them to dry. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And some people recommend to rotate them. We have two. So that if you, let's say you wear them every day one for one hour to go mm -hmm. to commute. Commute is another place you should wear. Then you can rotate them so that they dry. I just hang them in a clean place. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, next question. Um, do all N95 masks have electrostatic filtering? No, so I, I've come across those that don't. Okay. Um, but I couldn't find them for, for this presentation. Uh, it just adds a layer of uh, e e efficiency, but uh, from what I know, some, some don't have, I don't know which one has and which one don't. Okay. Um, and what, when, when are you still wearing a mask? Like what, is it, what, what is your personal choice um, when you're out and about, given everything that you know about this? What are you doing? Uh, Commute and grocery store. Mm -hmm. As I said, I had this point about the, the personal burden, right? I, I, I'm not bothered by masks, so it's easy for me to wear, mm -hmm. outdoor I don't. Uh, indoor gathering, if you know everybody and good air, I also don't. Um, it, it depends on the, uh, the seven day incidence number. It's now at uh, King County is 200. It's quite high in the nation, but I hope it goes down to less, much less than 100 and less than 10, and then we're much safer. Right? But now mm -hmm. it's grocery and uh, commute buses. Okay, great. Here's another one. Um, what do you think about the published estimates of length of time you are protected with a mask indoors? I've seen data suggesting that an N95 will protect you in an indoor setting for roughly an hour. Is this valid? Yeah, I, I know this table has been going all over the place. It's actually, these are, that's why I had this division between them on the right hand side, the plausible mechanism and the true measurement. All these numbers you see are computed and predicted, uh, just extrapolated from, from numbers of, of risk and so on. Uh, so I didn't even take them too seriously, but the trend is correct, right? The, mm -hmm. the better the mask, the longer you can stay. And I didn't know you said one hour with a N95 indoor. It's roughly right, but I, I would expect it to be longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it depends. I always check the, the ceiling and, and, and the ventilation. That's very important. Ah. It, it turns out to be a direction of the flow. It's very important. What, what does that mean if you're getting on an airplane or something? Tell us about that. Yeah, airplane, as you heard many times, is pretty safe because mm -hmm. uh, it has very strong ventilation and it, it stays within the row. So there are many studies on airplanes, so much fun to look at those. Uh, it's quite safe because exactly of the ventilation. It's, it's almost like outdoor. Oh. Uh, it's, okay. uh, it's within a row. It doesn't blow. And people have studied restaurants 
uh, cases of spreading, starting from my index case, and you can really almost reconstruct where the uh, the ventilation are, right? So it's oh. across the table. Mm -hmm. so, so that matters. Okay. Uh, okay, now that so few people are wearing masks at places like the grocery store, is it really helpful to wear a mask if others are not wearing them? Yes, the, in, in that case, it's for your own prot protection, right? My experience is, at least where I live, everybody's still wearing. Uh, and I would say if you don't feel comfortable, I, uh, I wouldn't, but I would still wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And uh, an important factor is check the, uh, the case incidence number, the number I mentioned, that really dramatically affects the risk, whether it's 100 or, or 10, right? Some places, some counties have 10 cases, per, 10 new cases per seven days per 100,000, others have hundreds. And so that matters much more. And you, the, the map is published every day by Seattle Times and, and other places. So I, I have to look at that. But um, what's what's the number at which you feel comfortable without a mask? How about when do you when do you feel like it's pretty safe out there? What's your magic number? Uh, I, I I change. I I had said for myself ten. And okay. Some countries are have mm -hmm. numbers mm -hmm. uh, across Washington State is at fifty now. Okay. But I think Seattle is even higher. <laughs> it's in the hundreds. But hundred per hundred thousand. That's one in thousand. It's yeah. still okay. It's just as I said, risk perception is very individual. Mm -hmm. you know, in which community you are. Um, here's here's a question. I know a well-fitted N95 is best, but what's better, a loose surgical mask or a well-fitted cloth mask? I'm not sure what what is a well-fitted cloth mask. Probably those that you can buy, the professional ones. Yes, yeah. The, the, the clothes might totally depend on the cloth, and there are so many studies, you can look them up. It depends on the thread number, you know, the, the number mm -hmm. that makes linen very expensive if, if it's 600, mm -hmm. and 200 if it's, those are much cheaper, and the 600 one, they have better protection. It's just density, but clothes, again, it's really for uh, big droplets, so to, to catch big droplets. It, it's not very helpful for aerosol. If you insist on using clothes masks, uh, there's those that can put a filter in it. Mm -hmm. and, and I wouldn't use it for too long because all the studies show that if they get wet, it's also not good. Oh, okay. But, but I would prefer, it's a very hard question. It's true yeah. that now I know that some clothes masks are fitting very nicely, very neatly, uh -huh. but they are not yeah. sealed. They're not as, as, right. as well uh, fitted as the N95. And surgical masks obviously are not. So. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. And here's here's your final question. Um, the the latest booster shot. Some of us can go out and get a second booster shot. What do you what do you think about that? Did you are you going to rush out and get the bo a second booster or? Yeah, I did it because uh, I had a very early first booster, mm -hmm. and, um, no reaction. Yeah, I, I think it's safe. There's just no no reason. Again, always think in terms of these two categories: data and mechanistic possibility. There's no reason why your fourth shot should be dramatically worse in terms of side effects, right? Okay. Because uh, vaccination is something that um, depends, if you have side effects, in, in many cases, it really depends on your, your molecular signature of whether you, are, you have the antibodies that triggers these allergic reactions. Also, I must say that uh, one of the very rare anaphylactic shock reaction is more common mm -hmm. in the second shot. Oh, but, oh yeah. interesting. Okay. But I, I, I just to did it. I, I don't think it would increase dramatically more the risk. So if you tolerate the first three, you should be fine. Yeah, and you and you want the second booster, right? I mean, because does does the immunity of the first booster kind of decrease? Yeah, that, that's, I think that's pretty clear. But yeah. uh, there's no data yet, right, as to whether okay. the second booster will uh, re-establish the, uh, the immunity for okay. you. I yeah. hope so. Yeah, we all do, we all do. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Sui. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us and helping, you know, help, helping us work through what, whether we should mask or not mask and when. So we really appreciate that. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. So I want to tell you, we have one more event coming up and um, that is our research round table. And the next one uh, is on Thursday, May 12th. And um, the topic is going to be impact and outcomes of COVID during pregnancy. And our speakers are going to be doctors Jen Hadlock and Samantha Picos from right here at ISB. And they will be joined, this is going to be interesting, it's a little bit different format than we're used to for our roundtables. They're going to be joined by Dr. Tanya Sorensen, a maternal fetal medicine physician from our affiliate Swedish. So that should be really interesting, I think, to hear from the scientists and then the doctors on the front lines about that issue. So that'll be a lot of fun. If you're on our email list, you'll get that information. You can always go to our website at any time and register right there. And, um, and we hope you had a great time this evening. And thank you very much for joining us. Good night. Thank you, everybody.